Hello and welcome to the International Student Experience, a Swansea University podcast where we delve into the stories and journeys of students from around the world who have come to study here in the UK. Today I'm joined by Therese Elnar. Thank you for joining us today. Hello. Hi. Uh, if you can just start by telling us what your name is, like where you're from and what your educational journey was to yeah, get to Swansea. Yeah, sure. Obviously, as mentioned, I'm Therese. I was raised in the Philippines. Um, for 14 years of my life and um, actually halfway throughout my high school journey I thought you know what I think I want to go to the UK for uni anyway so I might as well get British education. I did year 90 year 11 here for GCSEs and then I did my A-levels and I guess here we are now seven years since moving here. You've got good experience then of of both sides you know you're not new to the uk i'm definitely not new like i would say like oh gosh even before moving to the uk i was quite involved in british culture and i guess that it made it easier as well to transition because i knew what the people here would probably watch that are my age so i just thought why not use that as a conversation starter and then you know in high school i was starting to discover the joys of anime and everything who doesn't love a good anime you know so <laughs> I just use that really, and that's why I find it like actually, if I say anything, it's it's been easier for me to integrate here probably than most people, and I think I'm quite lucky to have that, I guess. And that's despite having autism. <laughs> um, I am horrible at social interactions, so it's actually been a blessing actually being able to adapt in seven years somehow. I mean, even then, so I'm still not completely adapted. So yeah, I'd just like to touch on the the autism, if that's okay, like. Mm. How was that in the Philippines when you were younger compared to a bit older here in the UK? Like, when did you realise that this was you? I was undiagnosed until 2022, so just about the end of COVID. And um, I didn't even realise that because um, as a child, right, I don't know if it's still a thing in the Philippines, but when I was a child, there's like this weird stigma that for me, that if you had autism, you would be associated for those that need more needs than, you know, me, for example, that would mean you'd be sent to like a special school, even if you're high functioning. If as long as you have a diagnosis of autism, you'd be segregated. Like, right. like here in the UK, as far as I'm aware, there are special needs school, right? But even if you're high functioning and you could probably, you know, get along fine in a state school with some support, um, you'll be sent to a special needs school. I'm kind of happy I got diagnosed here in the UK because I think I would be a complete completely different person if I went to a special needs school but um it was an interesting journey because at first I thought my autism was just um I actually got my diagnosis because of the amount of mental health crises I've had I thought that it was just oh it's just the joys of teenage being a teenager I thought but um after a while I think it was after my second mental health crisis that I was one of the lucky few people um that got comes to get me a support worker and that's um rare if you think about it because like a lot of people who are in camps um they don't sometimes they just don't get the support so the fact that i actually got it was you know i'd say it's a blessing so i got a support worker and one day i remembered oh gosh i remember this so clearly one day i was walking in my local area of course socially distanced two meters apart you know all that lovely stuff and I came home and then my support worker talks to my dad and she says, have you ever thought your daughter might be autistic? And he was like, no, <laughs> I, I don't think I am. He said, like, there's no way that she could be autistic. I'm not autistic. Your mom's not autistic. And that's what he said. And from there, that's just the diagnosis process just went from there, really. And I guess here we are and at the moment, like, you know, I'm grateful for the uni for giving me the support I needed because Oh gosh, I didn't expect the amount of support I got here, honestly. So, What sort of support has the university been able to offer you? So obviously you get the extra time, you get rest breaks, um, maybe using a laptop. In the exams I have to use a laptop, I get um, text-to-speech software and speech-to-text as well for make, to make it easier for me to answer questions. But alongside that, um, they understand that autism is just not like, you know, a one-time Con constant like this is how I will feel it is like like every disability it can fluctuate you could feel up in the clouds one day and you know go out and talk to people and be like you're actually open to doing stuff other days you just can't 
I don't know, you just don't have any energy to leave the bed or do anything. And I don't know, the sun is so bright in your eyes and it's absolutely horrid. And for that, the university has allowed me to leave the lectures halfway without people um, being informed about why I'm leaving. So no need for me to leave the room and a teacher go, Oi, why are you leaving? <laughs> you know? So thank God for that. But also, um, I'm thankful that um, because of this, they understand that my attendance will be a bit of, it'll be quite rocky because, um, oh gosh, no, I hope nobody looks through my attendance, but <laughs> <laughs> it's horrid. Like in-person attendance is like non-existent for me because um, I've had the unfortunate experience where people are too noisy. Like literally it's like the front, the back, the sides, they're all talking for some reason and I can't focus. So I thought to myself, it's literally, I'm probably going to be better off. At least I'll save some energy from being overwhelmed and I can actually focus on what I'm doing. So they just said, if your attendance is going to be a bit rocky, at least we don't have to go like, okay, what's going on? Because they understand about the situation that I'm going through. And, you know, I think that's that's more than I think most people would get because um, I have another autistic friend as well in another university and she doesn't get it, you know? She doesn't get that form of support because they don't offer it. So I'm actually quite happy. And I guess that's why I picked Swansea in the first place, to be honest, for uni. Because I heard this was on the on one of the only universities that provide that has like an autism specialist inside it. And I thought, when I'm in my journey trying to see how my disability affects me, it's nice to have a specialist to see and think what support might actually be appropriate and you know they would understand mm. so your diagnosis happened before you came to swansea then yeah um how do you think in and it you might not be able to answer but how do you think it would have played out for you if you hadn't had that diagnosis i wouldn't be alive now if it wasn't for the diagnosis i'll have to, i'll just be frank with that i don't know if my best friends will be listening to this in the philippines but if they are they do know the amount of times I went into crisis, I would probably say way too many. One is too much for someone. And I would probably say eight. Eight times is more than, you know, gosh, no. I don't wish it on anyone. And, you know, I probably wouldn't be alive here if it wasn't for my diagnosis. Because it was my diagnosis that helped me realize, hang on, I'm just not overreacting. I'm just emotionally unfortunately dysregulated it comes with it yeah i legit wouldn't be here talking to you now if it wasn't for actually not having the diagnosis you know yeah so yeah it never occurred to you that you might be autistic this thing had never crossed your radar no so then when you had that diagnosis was it like oh this makes sense now yeah it was more of a aha moment you know <laughs> um because Back before the diagnosis, um, actually on the way to the diagnosis, like building up to it, um, my friends, my best friends back in Reading who are um, autistic and have ADHD as well, he kept saying, you have autism. And I said, no way. Like, that, that doesn't make sense, does it? And he's like, oh, he's like, oh, I know I'm an autistic person when I see one. And he was right. Lo and behold, he was right. So, yeah, um, it never occurred to me. It had to actually, like, when people said back in the day, oh, you're autistic. Am I? <laughs> you know, I'd always just have that reaction. So, because, like, it just never occurred to me. Like, I never was aware what autism was because, um, personally, obviously, growing up in the Philippines, I feel that um, aware autism awareness isn't, like, as, you know, known, yeah. I would say, um, compared to um, here in the UK, you know? And now having best friends who have it, having, I mean, I have it. And I mean, my partner might potentially have it as well. So that actually opened my mind as to, you know, what it could be, how it can present in different people, you know? And I suppose then it, with it being a spectrum, it's also how this doesn't necessarily hold you back, but how it can open other doors and how it can reframe how you perceive things and how other people can perceive you as well. Exactly, yeah. Like, because I feel that with my autism, in some way or another, um, surprisingly, the, the the stereotype of autism is that you have no empathy. 
I genuinely feel like in the situation, like I'm like my boyfriend's listening ear a lot of the time. And even if he's like two years older than me and I've never worked a full time job for two years of my life, I still know what he goes through. Mm. You know, I can imagine how it feels in his shoes. And I feel that I can, you know, somewhat have a deeper connection to it. Like my best friend uh, that I mentioned that has autism and ADHD, he was married, he's married, but before that i never had a partner but i still understood what yeah. he was going through through that entire process and i feel that you know having more knowledge about things like those just breaks down the barriers that you know well, that should be non-existent realistically speaking of you know what autism is yeah and as you mentioned it can open doors as to like you know different opportunities how people feel and you can you probably might um have them unlock something that they never knew how have you found navigating swansea universe like literally how have you found it like from like being in accommodation to buses to being on campus how what's that like for you you can probably talk for my face <laughs> i'm just like oh, oh, oh what a journey that was and it still is what a journey because um i'll be honest with you um my course mates were surprised to know that i didn't have any friends I still don't. I feel like um, the people I like, meet in societies and some people in the digital content creators, it's just like acquaintances. I mean, I'm really familiar with you, so that works as well. But I feel that with how people define friends at the moment is, well, someone you could talk to outside of work and inside of work and you can tell them everything and all that stuff, right? For me, acquaintances is just like, that's my definition of acquaintances. That's the thing. And because like, as I, I guess it came from me being undiagnosed as a kid, but I found that for being myself, I just got picked on. So growing up, I've been pickier and pickier and pickier about my friends. So now I just think like, unless like you can bear with me going in crisis halfway and being like, help me, can you call someone for me? You're not my friend if you can't do that, you know? Because I've had so many friends in the past who just left me in the ditch when I was in like my lowest points. And, you know, it's heart wrenching. And I guess just to protect myself, like I've just been really picky, you know, like I enjoy talking to people. God, don't get me wrong. <laughs> like I enjoy talking to people. But when it comes to sensitive subjects like that, where literally my life could be on the line. I've been really picky about it. And that's why, like, navigating university, oh gosh, not even navigating university in terms of friends, but like, accommodation wise, you know, is lonely. I turned my accommodation into like a little home of mine and, you know, discovered some new hobbies along the way. So that was quite nice. But it was really daunting at first. And I am, like, I'm going to be honest, I'm still adjusting, you know? Like, I know people would probably go, like, oh, I've adjusted and I'm completely fine. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm still getting there, I would say. And then with buses, like, oh, that was the probably one of the bigger changes for me. Because I come from Reading, you see. So, you know, being near London and having, you know, Reading, the buses services there are very frequent, right? So having moved here and uh, having not having that, you know, it actually made me step back and actually think what are the other opportunities for me to actually you know go around and all that stuff and i never learned to cycle before university so that's where i learned how to cycle so then i thought in the summer let's learn how to cycle so i would say the you know adapting to the place is hard at first but once you actually have a sit and think about it there are ways around it you know and yeah, um, I feel like university is one of those better places. Like, I feel that in terms of academic support and like social support, so far university has been the most supported point in my life. I feel, even if like I'm still having no friends and everything, I have the support of a support worker from DSA provide with of you know student finance and everything. I have the disability officers from the disability team. Um, I have my academic tutors. I have student support from my faculty contacting me every two weeks just to make sure I'm getting along fine with my studies. I think that's a lot of support, you know? And, you know, that's like excluding the stuff like 
community mental health team and everything. You could probably tell just from that, despite being so lonely in the social, sur- in the so- in the, you know, socially, with barely any people to call friends for me, you know, having the professional support around actually helps me push through with uni, I feel. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Have you been able to at least find like-minded people? Have you been able to, to see something that could be a community for you that help you over your journey be a bit less lonely? Like, Yeah. Like, I'll be honest, like, I'm part of the esports society right now. Um, I'm the content coordinator right now. And, you know, actually confiding in them has actually been quite therapeutic, I feel. Like, obviously, like, they probably wouldn't know about, you know, what happens to me behind the scenes with my mental health and everything. But they're just a nice way to distract myself from the stress of study and university. But, like, there are there are societies to help me confide in. But as I mentioned earlier, like, because of how I perceive friends, I would just think more of them as acquaintances. But still, that's something you can hang out with. Like, that's why I mentioned it earlier. It doesn't mean that I don't have much of a social circle according to friends. It doesn't mean that... um. I'm not per, per se lonely because I still have people to talk to, you know? It's a weird it's a weird loophole, isn't it? It's just <laughs> like, I have no friends, but I, you know, some people think I do have friends, Yeah, you know? It's like, that's how I'd perceive it. Do you think it would be important for anyone autistic or, or non-autistic, when they're coming to university for the first time, it's a potentially very lonely experience, especially if you've come from a, a different country. Do you think it's important to to try and have a social circle to, oh gosh, to, yeah. to find that community oh gosh yeah <laughs> like um even then so like obviously when you first come into you know uni especially if you're from abroad i found it um because i've obviously i had actually left like in the philippines i've left halfway through um high school i think it's really important to try and maintain firstly your social friendships that you have at home especially if you're an international student because when you get here you don't know anyone you probably know, like, you know, the faces that you've talked to at uni, like, you know, like the admissions officer or whatever, but nothing really past that. So even if you have eight hours difference between you, I feel it's so, 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 so important to keep your friends there. And I still have my friends back home. Hello, if you're listening. <laughs> but like, when you come here, you know, you have to have friends here eventually because... Um, especially if you're from abroad, you know, your friends are not going to be available when it's morning here and it's nighttime on the opposite of the world. So, like, even just having someone to talk to, even if it's not something regarding your mental health, even just someone to just have talk to about similar interests, gosh, that, it will be, it's a godsend. It's a godsend. It will help you so, so much. As long as you have, you know, just someone, just yeah. anyone. I'm curious about when when did you engage with the services that are available at the university? Was it when you came here or did you get in touch with like the disability office or the autism um, team before you came here? So obviously I've applied as a home student. It could be different for an international student completely. But personally, I've applied it through UCAS and I like stated to it that I have autism. Because I already had my diagnosis as I was submitting my UCAS application. From there, the disability team contacted me. And actually, for prospective students, if you're a home student, one of the ways that, um, you know, the disability team actually helps you transition to uni is they hold an entire two days. It was two days for me, um, two days transition event. And what it was, was you stayed in Singleton um the accommodation up in singleton i can't gosh do i remember i think it was penmain actually that you stayed in you had people who also had autism like you um alongside the disability officers that you would be with soon and we went to social dice down in wayne street and everything so they are trying to get you into um you know just stuff even just before this is before you even got in you chose this university as well right you know so I feel that, yeah, there is a lot of things that the university does to help like with people transitioning because you'll be surprised that, you know, some people might think that there's nothing, 
Like, I applied to four other universities, and Swansea was the only one that offered a similar thing. That's quite valuable then, isn't it? Like, it, it seems like it could just, to, to someone who doesn't need it, like a quite a small thing, but yeah. if you really need it, yeah. it's massive. Yeah, because, like, at first, like, so I visited Swansea back in 2018 pre-COVID, right? So, obviously, in the span of four years where I entered in 2022... Four years is a lot of time for a city to change, I think, you know? So I feel that actually that transition event was like the most key thing of my entire journey, especially when it comes to adjusting, because then I would know, oh, there's a local Tesco, there, here's Wine Street. If somebody's going to be talking about the McDonald's in the centre, there it is, you know? <laughs> so like in some way or another, even if it's like, you know, Cut like a month or two and you know knowing Swansea like things can change in two months sometimes <laughs> you know so like yeah um that transition event is helpful even if it may seem small but it helps to people who wants to get familiar with the environment because you don't want to let's be honest here you don't want to have the the workload of having to deal with meeting new flatmates and then you're having to go to societies and actually try and meet people and then you have your studies, you have your lecture, you have da 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 da, you know. And then for probably someone who has autism, they'll have to get used to the environment. Maybe that one neighbor knocking every time at 3 a.m., maybe the buses, because I had to get used and if you want to know my experience, I had to get used to the buses. I had to get used to um the timetable. I had to get used to cooking for my own, making sure I know how to cook my own comfort food, which is, that was a journey. <laughs> and yeah, like everything that comes to university, but probably imagine it like times 1.5 more yeah. than the normal person, you know, and that can be overwhelming. Like <laughs> that, my, my threshold's not that high. I'll tell you that now, yeah. you know. Has it been a positive experience for you though? Like, have you been able to... You've come here at the same time as you've had your autism diagnosis, which is a massive thing. So those are, those are two massive things to happen to someone in their life and to happen at the same time. It could be very easy for that to be negative experiences. Would you say overall that it's been as good for you as it possibly can? Like, has it been positive? I would say like it's been a growing journey. I wouldn't say per se if it's positive or negative. I would say more like it helped me grow because like... um. As I started foundation year, it was very lonely for me. And that's when everybody started crying about the cost of living crisis, which is unfortunately still a thing right now. So you could probably imagine, um, not only was I battling the fact that, you know, I had my diagnosis that year. I just went to uni that year. I had to bite with what every student has to go through as well on top of that. So it was a tough first year, but... After, you know, getting the hang of it every now and then, you know, I feel like I was able to grow it into a positive experience. I mean, when I heard the digital content creators team opening, like a position, like a bunch of positions uh, last, I think, oh gosh, was it last year? Yeah, last year. Yeah. Last year? I can't remember anymore. Oh no. But um, <laughs> yeah, when the positions opened, I knew I was like, I could turn this entire university experience around mm. where I can. And starting with content creators yeah. team, because um, prior to university, um, I was doing my video editing experience. That was my special interest um, when I, since I was 14. I was video editing a lot. <laughs> and yeah, I thought with, even if I'm doing an engineering degree, you know, elevated to the next level. You yeah. Know, you can turn it around. That's what I told myself. And here we are, you know? Yeah. Has it been important to you then for something like the content creators and even this this podcast? Has it been important for you to to be able to tell your story? It's always been important to me. I'll be honest, if I wasn't really smart in science, if I got really horrible grades in my GCSEs, I would have done media. Either way, I would have done media. And that stemmed from um, when I was in video editing, I just had this tendency. I've grew this love to actually tell a story. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly like as a child I never really like I wasn't really a fan of them you know so I felt that growing up I just felt like I had stuff to tell yeah and I wanted like my experience to get out there because you know I may be one voice of many tons of voices but 
you never know that one person who could be listening right now would actually think, hey, that's what I'm going through as well. You know, I'm glad to know that I am not the only one suffering through this. And so I would say, yeah, like content creation and this podcast as well, which thank you for the opportunity. I never actually said thank you, <laughs> but like, you know, it's been really important for me to tell actually a story where possible in whatever form. Because imagine it was on the other side of that and then you were that person finding your story and how valuable that could be at the right times in your life then exactly yeah like you just never know like you may be just doing a bit for now but you never know uh, once goes out you never know that that story would be really helpful and there's like a few autism like you know like autism content creators online and that's how it's been for me that's how i learned about my my disability actually like having them spill their experiences and say I've been through the same shoes as you similarly, right? And that just doesn't apply to autism. That applies to everything, by the way. Like, you never know that there could be someone who could be listening about considering Swansea University, but hearing one side of the story and then actually having that student perspective about how it actually is. So your second year... Mechan um, chemical engine is it second year or third year it's like I'm in my first year ah. but it's my second year at university if that makes sense because right. I did a foundation year and then I switched over to a year in industry oh right okay cool because yeah, yeah. I originally wanted to do a year in industry but unfortunately A levels didn't go to plan which oh yeah I'd like to mention by the way the university is so good when it comes to adapting to horrible results I think, what was it called? If you put, like, Swansea as one of your choices, I remember they would, like, try and adapt you to get you in. And that has been a life saviour for me. That's just why um, the university's good. I got... I was in crisis at the time of my A-levels alongside... I sat my chemistry A-level with a fever because um, I tried to tell my, you know, my sixth form at the time, I was like, hey, I really can't sit this. But they were like, you have to. So... I had to go in, unfortunately, and sit it with a fever. Um, unfortunately, I explained the situation to the university about everything, and they were like, yeah, we understand. We understand, like, it can happen to people, and we will give you a spot, even if it has to be sitting a foundation year. And I've talked to them. I was like, can I switch to over to your industry at a later point? They're like, yeah. So, yeah, props to them for that. I can understand why it's there, at least. You know? Like, if you haven't sat A-levels, if you haven't been in education for years and years and you're thinking of doing a completely new discipline, like if you're switching from, I don't know, like me, like media to engineering or any science field, that foundation year is very essential for you because it covers everything that you need to know, the maths, the science, the report writing, the English, maybe even if you need it, you know? And for people who need more time to adjust, that's what it's there for. It's, a, as I like to call it at that time, the chill year. <laughs> the chill year. Because at that time, I could just focus on getting myself settled at university. That foundation year has been essential, even if at that time, people probably recall me saying, oh, it's horrible. <laughs> but no, I actually took a step back and thought that was actually probably, that, that was a time in my life I needed just to adjust and just to get myself sorted and get the support I need. Because, you know, if I went straight into my first year after all of that, no. <laughs> no, that's not happening. <laughs> Did you have your interest in chemical engineering before the foundation? Was it something you knew you always wanted to do? Yeah, actually. Um, I always wanted to do chemical engineering. Well, I'll be honest with you, like, I've been thinking about it since I was in year seven. Interestingly enough, one of my family friends asked me this question at an interview. I remember it so clearly. Is it useful for plastic to actually be in existence? And that question, I remember debating to him in that interview for that grammar school that I did in the Philippines um, for high school. I remember debating to him and saying, yes and no. Depends. Depends how you look at it. And... The more and more I hear about climate change and, you know, do you remember Super Typhoon Haiyan? Yeah. Yes, I sat uh, yeah. through it. I sat, oh my God. Where yeah. we, so that right there at the time. Oh my word. I wasn't in the eye of the storm, but like the tail of it was like around, passing around my area. So 
yes, unfortunately, I have witnessed it. And I was lucky to be like, you know, actually in a sturdy house and everything. But I remembered I talked to my best friend, who's still my best friend, by the way, and in around year seven time. And I asked her about her experience and she said, no, you have to start from scratch. It was, it was a very, very saddening thing to hear. And I thought from that point forward, I want to make something that helps people, especially during these types of emergency, because seeing it for myself, even then, so I had to experience the, the outages. Even then, so I had to experience not having access to water. You know, I was fortunate, as I said, that I was a bit well off and I recovered quicker from that storm. But what about those who had to come start completely from scratch? They're kind of laughing yeah. in a ditch. You need to have money. Like, you, like, it's impossible. So I thought from that point on, I want to actually make a change. I want to actually make a change just by, you know, reducing carbon emissions. Just as something as simple as that. And even now, I would say chemical engineering has probably strengthened my love for it more. Because here we are discovering about new technologies that have something to do with it, you know? So... Yeah, I'd say from a child, I guess it just got, it started and it just grew, I'd right. say. That's definitely an, an area, because I, I would have normally asked what's next for you, but you're still fairly early in your degree. So I suppose it's just continuing to cement that love for chemical engineering. Have you got any advice? Have you got anything you'd like to say? Have you got any advice to any students, home or UK, uh, autistic or not, who might be considering studying at university? It will be a difficult ride. I, I'm i just going to have to say it bluntly. I know that people would think, of some, I would think, say something like a bit more positive on that end, but I would much rather be blunt about what the experience is. And it is difficult. It will be rough, but what matters more is how you push through it. Like, it is okay to stumble along the way and you're probably going to struggle at first, but that's okay. I mean... At that time, you would probably be thinking, this is awful. This is horrible. Nobody goes through it. Everyone goes through a certain phase. May it not be in first year, like, or you'll be in your, literally your last year. You will go through it at some point where you would start feeling the brunt really hardly. So that's what I'd just say, like, just push through. Push through. You will see it as awful in that instant, but it will be worth it. In hindsight, it was it helped shape you who you are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not let the trials get in the way, but to it's how keep you going. grow. Like on, like on, you know, like when you're on that spot, you will definitely think, like, why is this a thing? Why am I going through this? Nobody goes through this. Why is this important? But then later on, you actually have that moment months and months later, and be like, oh, okay, that actually is coming in handy now. Cool. So. Yeah, like you will hate it at first, but you will eventually understand why. Keep on going. Keep going. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Beautiful. And thank you for your time today, Therese. And if you've enjoyed this and want to find out more about studying in the UK and what that's like, or if you want to hear any more of the episodes in this series, please visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash international. <laughs>